if we can't give to our children and grandchildren a better world, then what the f*** have we done with our lives? If you actually look at the market, there's only five or six really solid coins. And 90% of the coins on the market are going to die. And those six or eight coins are going to go to $100 billion. 12, 13 months ago, I embarked on this mission. And one by one, I started persuading people who had no clue who I was in blockchain to trust me with their pennies and either take a stand, sponsor the show, or dedicate some of their time to grace the stage to speak at my show. And today, I was blessed to have 8,500 people gracing the show for the first time. The Future Is Now presents Together with Skycoin Malta Blockchain Summit 2018 Are you here today to learn how to make more money within the system that we are trying to escape? Or are you here to learn how you can be free as individuals? Blockchain Island has become one of the more friendly habitats for crypto in 2018. Leading the way in official government blockchain legislature, welcoming all explorers of the future to the Maltese coast. With its rich history from the Knights of Templar to the Holy Grail, this island always had something magical about it. It is this magic that was captured by Iman Poulos and formulated into one of the leading blockchain gatherings from the get-go with over 8,500 attendees flocking to Malta. In this film, we get ready for a new year ahead of us as we seek to understand how can we build a better future for the industry of blockchain as we catch up with old friends and top brass from the industry. Miko Matsumura of Evercoin Exchange. We really want to make sure that there are primary use cases and primary value creation before we get any kind of speculative increase. Whether the speculation is coming from like a financial institution, a government, or whether it's coming from like ICO, like it really doesn't matter as long as we actually have a primary economic activity at the base. John McAfee of McAfee Crypto Team. We are using the blockchain to make money rather than to make products, aren't we? Don't people invest going, is this coin going to go up? I get it all the time. Mr. Maffey, what predictions do you have for this? I go, F predictions, dude. You're using this wrong. I got no problem with making money. We should make money. But that cannot be the sole purpose, else we're killing the goose that lays the gold in it. Brandon Synth of Skycoin. Ten years in the industry. A company that is affecting change while creating a use case in countries where the need is real. The most important thing is that it's grassroots, it's bottom up. We don't have to go to the president. We don't have to go to the central government. We don't have to get permission. We just, it's a local, it's grassroots at the community level, at the people on the ground, being, giving them a tool that they can now use to improve their lives. Foo Styles of Women in Blockchain. This has been one of the most diverse uh, blockchain conferences I've been to ever. The quality of people were so great. Um, I met amazing women here, like really great women who are doing really great things that I'm collaborating with um, from all over the world. Simone Giacomelli of Singularity Net. What we're trying to do here is to uh, increase the odds of democratizing AI. Nothing scales as fast as adoption. So that's why we're pleased to be here in Malta and discussing with the government how do we work together in really bringing this uh, open future uh, and making it a reality. Jackie Hart of Zero Point, a new way to network. I felt so graciously welcomed from the moment I landed. I mean, everything was just waiting for us. The entire summit was explicitly designed, logistically perfect. 
Mark Hamadi of Vivaris Capital. Long-term investors hold, hold, hold. So if it goes down, it goes down. But if it's a legitimate business and it solves a pain that you have, it's going to always last. And Iman Poulos, the founder of the Malta Blockchain Summit. Today was a special occasion, these past few days. I mean, it was the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of Satoshi Nakamoto, 10 yes. years. So we couldn't have timed it better then. And it was also the launch of the VFA Act, the bill that has regulated the blockchain space in Malta. So the buzz is real, this is no hype. As the so-called crypto nuclear winter crawled up on the Bitcoin world in late November, Malta nevertheless showed the true power of blockchain community and how much potential the crypto world truly has. Don't miss the amazing Malta Blockchain Awards with Prime Minister of Malta, Joseph Muscat. Brandon Synth and John McAfee center stage during the panels. Future Rama Blockchain Innovators After Party with a surprise appearance by Mike Butcher of TechCrunch. And of course, the Zero Point with Jackie Hart at the historical presidential Verdala Palace that hosted European kings and queens since 1586. This was a gathering that will forever go down in crypto world's history. A light at the end of the tunnel. A new hope for a different tomorrow in a jurisdiction that can change it all. A way in for innovators of the future and a lesson for the stories of the past. This is the episode we've all been waiting for. Malta Blockchain Summit 2018. Created by One Day Productions. The future is what you make of it. The future is now. We are in Malta. The Blockchain Island, here to experience a great event that didn't keep the futurists away even when it rained. We are about to go to the Malta Blockchain Summit that has attracted over 7,000 people to this European Union jurisdiction that's very hot right now. Let's go and check it out. Blockchain innovators from all over the world came together to partake in this event. But it all started the night before the summit, right on the 10-year anniversary of Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin white paper, with the Malta Blockchain Awards, the Golden Globes of Crypto, where we had the chance to dine amongst our friends, the frontrunners of the space. Thank you very much for Multi Blockchain Summit for organizing this amazing awards dinner. This is just the beginning for Acer Bench and I'm very excited with our growth. Thank you very much. The Coin Telegraph. Hi guys, my name is Catherine Rouse. I'm an assistant editor in chief of Coin Telegraph and I'm very happy and honored to be here and to accept this award on behalf of Coin Telegraph. You know, there are people who contribute to blockchain in very obvious ways. And this is a fact. They have been there since day one. And I feel truly honored to be giving this award of the outstanding contribution to the blockchain island to none other than Mr. Steve Tenton himself. What a coincidence. The 31st of October 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto published his white paper. Ten years on this day, and now the whole country is united behind this idea, the idea of the blockchain island. Thank you. ICO Bench, Cointelegraph, and many others caught the shining trophy from the Maltese ceremony that night. And the next morning marked the first official day of the summit. The whole initiative was supported by Prime Minister of Malta, Joseph Muscat, which makes for exciting news knowing that this is it, a real blockchain island with full government support for this thriving technology.
the seed landed on very fertile soil. And as a government, we saw the opportunity to start watering carefully the seed to make sure that it grows in an organic way, but more so in finding new ways on how technology can improve the lives of people. That is the discussion we are currently having in Malta. And my message to you all is that we want to hear from you. We want to hear your ideas. We are a fertile land for opportunities and for discussion. This country has solid foundations and is ready to make the conditions right for the next leap in robotics, AI, IoT, to go wherever our imagination can take us. Let us think big, and together I think we can do the next leap. Thank you very much and good luck for the conference. Miko. Hey, good, good to see you, you in Malta. Yeah, excellent. How Malta you been? The place. It's been Super a long time. exciting. It's a great place to be right now. We just uh, incorporated the Evercoin Exchange in Malta. So we're in the provisional license to operate here. So Malta is definitely the hot place to be. So all these islands really, right? We have Malta, Barbados, Bermuda, Puerto Rico. You know, Barbados, Bermuda, Puerto Rico, they're also on the map. They're offering treats incentives for people to join. What do you think, uh, you know, how's Malta doing in, among the uh, competition? One of the things that's unique here is really that we have material and substantive le legislation, right? So I really feel like that's going to be uh, unique. And the other part that I think is very unique is that it's really part of the EU. So you have the 28 member states, you know, about a half a billion people within that jurisdiction. So I that really feel unique. like that's a very, that that's, a nice, that's a nice platform. What do you feel about the overall sort of the emotional state of the industry? As price is not really important. We got down to that point where people realize that it's more about creating the use cases. It's more yeah, about the absolutely. technology and absolutely. not the price. At the moment, like there's really nothing to be concerned about. I think it is absolutely about value. It's about use cases. It's about developing like crypto economies that really serve users. So I think as soon as we start to have those kinds of things, we will start to have actually an organic upswell, right? Instead of a speculative upswell. So at the moment, until we have real products and services in the crypto economy, there's no real point in the thing pumping, right? If it goes up, it goes up, it comes back down again, right? What we really need is we really need value. We need things, use cases, users, we need more traction. We are a disjointed, chaotic community. We need a little more order. And listen, I'm not a man that wants order. <laughs> I like chaos, but we're too chaotic. We are going off in too many directions and we have very little guidance. When I say guidance, I'm talking about inner guidance, awareness. Like, what the f are we doing? What the f are we doing? Are we actually going to fulfill the dream that began this entire process? Which means, yes, we're gonna free ourselves from this fucking wicked, corrupt power structure, or are we gonna, in the short term, go, you know what? By cooperating with it, we're gonna make a lot more money. Well, you know what human nature is going to lean towards. However, I believe the power of the mathematics, the formulas, the, the energy behind these systems will win out even over our human frailties of greed and, and you know, what have you. What's the use case as of now? Is there anything that's coming to that point of becoming an official use case? Ethereum was the use case of ICO, Bitcoin is the electronic store of value, but you know, what's out there? Everyone's looking for so-called Netscape moment. It, to me, it feels like the institutions are gonna lead. So when you actually look at FinTech use cases, institutional products like ETF and these kinds of things, I think are gonna have a much more expansive effect on this economy. So you're starting to see big players. So you're starting to see like Ice Exchange with Bact, and you're starting to see players like NASDAQ or players, you know, like, like T uh, the TD American Trade. So you're see seeing really serious players starting to enter into this space. So I really think institutional capital is going to lead this next wave as opposed to retail. Use cases, beating corrupt power structures and not straying off the path seems to be the golden formula towards an organic upswell in blockchain adoption, and hence Bitcoin's price. But will it really be the institutionals driving the way forward or the so-called independent innovators? 
Skycoin has been at it for 10 years, going through the ups and downs of the industry, surviving several nuclear crypto winters, all the while coming out on top and creating a tangible use case with Skywire. It's decentralized internet that is providing high speeds for villages in Africa and the third world. but also competing with Comcast by working on a 1 gigabit per second internet for $20 a month for the first world countries, including the United States. With over 10,000 nodes globally, Skycoin is creating the world's largest community-powered mesh net, revolutionizing the internet. We met with its founder, a cryptographer with a vision, one of the early developers of Bitcoin, Brandon Sin Smetana, to get the inside scoop on everything in the world of blockchain. So how are you going to make that change? What's the plan to scale the project and to make a difference in those countries of need where Skycoin technology could be revolutionary? Uh, so there's a mixture of a, a sort of a public partnership model where you want to work, work with local governments and um, corporations and different NGO groups. You have to have boots on the ground. If you're going to build a mesh network in a city, you have to have people there to install the equipment and people who are invested in the network, so people who can earn money from running the, uh, running the nodes. So one of the things is, in order to build a market economy in Africa, you need infrastructure, you need roads, you need power plants, you need telecommunication equipment, you need ways of getting products into the rural Africa, then you need stores in order to be able to sell them, you need supply chains. The, the development models that have worked in the Western countries are not working in the third world and the developing world. And so now they're looking at other solutions like blockchain and uh, local, community structure, uh, local community solutions. Because development has to happen fundamentally at the bottom level, at the base level, at the village level. It has to, uh, infrastructure is bottom up, it's not top down. If you give the, the leader, the president of a country, $100 million, he steals half of it, and then he gives it, his brother steals half of it, then the mayor steals half of it, and then whoever the mayor pays, the construction company steals half of it. And to build a school, by the time the money has gotten down to the local level, all of it's been stolen. We don't have to go to the president. We don't have to go to the central government. We don't have to get permission. We just, it's a local, it's grassroots at the community level, at the people on the ground, being, giving them a tool that they can now use to improve their lives. It's about, the biggest thing I look at is, is there a pain? Is there a pain in the industry? If there's a pain, uh, then let's use the blockchain to solve it, if it makes sense. But if it's a legitimate business, and it solves a pain that you have, it's gonna always last. And, 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 then, and then it's like, how can you scale it? And then, you know, support it. And, and you know, and so, so and then, is it helping create jobs? And and if it does that, then then why not? This is actually a, like a personal supercomputer um, or a personal cloud that you can have in your house or if you're for your company or your business. So each of these cards can process 50 uh, megabits per second. So if we're doing uh, a lot of networking and VPN and encryption, you actually need like 40 computers to uh, process all of the data. So this is a, sort of the backbone for uh, for, the, this, for a scalable system to support like 20 gigabits, 50 gigabits, 100 gigabits per second. But it's at different stages. So like we just started releasing the hardware project uh, two years ago. And then this year we did one hardware project. And this year we have another 15 hardware projects. And of those, four or six will be delivered to the public like uh, antenna, SkyMiner, hardware wallets. And then we have things like Skywire. So people are really excited about Skywire because that's, Skywire is actually probably the first concrete real world application of blockchain where we're going to have people actually using blockchain for something that they do every day in their daily lives that they're paying coins and getting paid and providing networking services and for the first time in my experience i've been around 73 years something arrived in my awareness that had the power to provide my children something which I'd never had, absolute freedom from the power that manipulates and controls this world. Because that power is our master, which makes us slaves.
John McAfee, a true cyberpunk and a longtime rebel to the mainstream, joined Brandon Synth on stage to discuss the dark side of the chain, both having experienced some extraordinary circumstances in the past, from the kidnapping of Brandon to John's escape from Belize. Monty Munford couldn't help but ask how it all went down. Tell, tell us more about the dark side of your life. I don't even know where to start. So I was in a Bitcoin from the beginning, and I've just seen crazy shit. I can't even talk about it. Um, you I, sure? <laughs> so I, I got like kidnapped like uh, three months ago, and uh, like four members of my marketing team. You were kidnapped in my house. Yeah, home invasion. I had a uh, five members of my uh, four members of my marketing team came in, and they uh, had, had five gang members beat the shit out of me, <coughs> broke my rib, knocked a tooth out. Uh, and there, where was this? Which city? In, in, my, in Shanghai. Whoa. And uh, beat the shit out of my wife. And then uh, they, they were like, gonna, they're like, give us 10,000 Bitcoin or we'll kill you. And I'm like, I don't have 10,000 Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, I'm really sorry about what happened to you and your wife, clearly. And I'm glad they, they were brought back to justice. Now, you, sir, when you left Belize, huh? you had an interesting time. It, well, you know, the first of all, I'd been on the run for 45 days. What were they after you for? Oh, allegedly for murder. Okay, but they had killed my neighbor for f- sake. I'd, I'd been at war with the con- with the country for months. And by the way, I wasn't charged with anything ever. Right. What they did is is my neighbor was shot. All of the neighbors were questioned. Right. They wanted to question me. Well. F- no, I'm not getting my fingers removed in uh, some back room. So, um, <clears throat> but anyway, I had arranged with uh, Vice magazine, who sent two reporters um, down to Belize to monitor everything, including wow. my escape if it did, or my arrest, whichever were to happen. So they were both white. I was white. I uh, had uh, Robert King, the famous war photographer. He was there. And one of my ex-girlfriends who looks white. And then I had retained a close friend, a Belizean, that had a van with the visitor, you know, with the, uh, the circus logo on the side. So what I had done is I had been watching the weather reports. I waited until there was 100% chance of rain. But why on earth? Pardon? Why? Because they had roadblocks every 10 miles on every road looking well, for me. Well, it's raining the police won't be watching. I know for a fact. <laughs> the police in Belize do not stand in the f***ing rain and check cars. So I have photos of us driving by police who are huddled in their, in their trucks looking at us with my photograph on the dashboard. Okay. And they're watching us drive by. That's how Hi. I escaped. Yes. <laughs> The next morning, I took a fishing boat out to sea and, and into Livingston, Guatemala. So that was it. Very uh, good story. Brandon, uh, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> After this intense panel, we followed Brandon to Jackie Hart's Zero Point, a new way to network by leveling yourself literally to your Zero Point energy, opening up, sharing your superpowers, your wishes, achievements, and regrets. The gathering was held at the Maltese Presidential Verdala Palace as a special part of the summit sponsored by Digital X. This presidential summer residence, by the way, has been built in 1556 and hosted royals from King George VI of the United Kingdom to Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. It was great to see female thought leaders like Jackie present at the summit with their projects and unique approach to the space. We spoke to Jackie and also caught up with Foo Styles of Women in Blockchain Foundation to get their take on bettering the female presence in the crypto world. To speak about women in blockchain, you as one of the community and thought leaders in the space, how can the overall blockchain community increase the presence of women thought leaders? Obviously today in this 8,500 delegates, I would say probably again, 85 or 90% were, were men. I've seen some women who are, I would say, new to the space, new to technology or finance, and they are curious. And so I think that they're just kind of peeking over the fence and seeing what's going on because they know that this is an industry to get involved in. So I actually applaud them for, for showing up. The wonderful thing about blockchain is that it's decentralized and it's really like I've never seen a more diverse, you know, uh, 
group of people in technology, like literally from all over the world. And we come to places all over the world. Literally, we, we gather in droves. It's amazing to see that. And now that more women are, are becoming part of this, there needs to be a push for opportunities. You know, there should be speaker roll calls for women and, to, and, and also for, for men like yourself to help uh, elevate these women and refer them. I'm, you know, that's why I founded the Women in Blockchain Foundation to be a resource for companies and uh, for people to find women because I know that our voice needs to be heard and it needs to be um, out there for other women to come and step up. Back to the action at the summit. The major theme of discussion was closing in the institutional regulators, the government, and could these two entities ever find a future with crypto? For the crypto economy, there's really only three major sources, right? There's the primary Keynesian economy, which is buying and selling retail things, right? And then there's kind of the institutional, and then there's obviously the central bank and monetary policy use cases. So I feel like that's really, those are the three major things that we're going to see expanding. And it's really a race to see which one gets there first. This movement into acceptance by governments, banks, and those in control can only be temporary. Because what is cryptocurrency? Number one, permissionless. And we are begging governments to permit us to use a permissionless system. See the contradiction, people. It is a trustless system because of the beauty of the mathematics that underlies and powers the system. And yet you want to trust an untrustworthy entity to permit you to use a trustless, permissionless system. This would be the definition of insanity if you were in a psychologist's office. Back, Futures, Goldman, mm -hmm. Ben Rock, all these players mm -hmm. are coming in. A lot of them have been actually bad actors in the Wall yeah. Street space, right? Bumps and dumps, all those uh, you know things that come from that space are now slowly moving into this space. Is this a good thing? Some people say it's a validation of this industry that you know the institutional great capital is coming in. What do you think? So I'm an insider, and I actually get a lot of inside information like I, I was in Dubai I went to Dubai Futures and the government brought us there for two months and I'm there talking like these people in Dubai and there's this one guy and he's like hey you have a crypto exchange I'm like yeah I have some software we can do that for you and and I'm like well what's it for and then they have these people and there's a company and I look it up and it's like inner alpha group and it's like owned by the Rothschilds so I'm like okay Rothschilds are want a crypto exchange like what <laughs> and then I go to Israel and I meet these guys and there's a color coin company and they got 20 million dollar investment from Soros and Deutsche Bank. And I see this guy and like Goldman Sachs invested in this and JP Morgan invested in this and these really big power players, people that are so big that they're basically like invisible, like they own everything. You don't, you don't even, you know, some of these families, some of these companies, these banks are, uh, we're talking about hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of assets. I think those people are going to be unpleasantly surprised when they realize that they are in a world that they can't control like they control. Because why? How does Goldman and Morgan Stanley and all of these other control? Because of their connections with the Fed, with the government, with the SEC, with the regulatory powers. But when we have a truly distributed exchange that works, the government can't control us, it can't stop us, it, knows, it will not know what we're doing. There's no central uh, server that they can shut down. So when that happens, these people, especially, you know, Goldman Sachs is gonna go, what the f happened? They are not in control of this world like they are in control of the previous one. And then we, as individuals, will be in control of our little sphere of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. F them. They cannot control us anymore. I know, I, I, I'm not sure I can say publicly, I can about secrets, but what, uh, what uh, I, I know give for us example. Exclusive. Give us exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and the big players, the families and the, 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 the family offices, 
they're buying up all the quality crypto assets. Right now, at the same time the public's dumping, they're quietly acquiring massive positions in Bitcoin. And they're, they build infrastructure, and I know this because I talk to the people, the developers. Uh, they build infrastructure to allow brokers to buy Bitcoin, to buy Ethereum, and to buy into crypto funds. Something like an ETF, where you're going to be able to go into a brokerage account and, and, and a pension fund is now going to be able to put two or four or six percent of their fund into Bitcoin. And they, they built this infrastructure and they've been testing it for six or eight months. So Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan know, they pretend like, oh, Bitcoin's bad, we're not going to prove the ETF, we're not going to, but they know that they built the infrastructure. They went to this company and said, do this, do this, do this. They changed the laws to allow them to do it. So they're like, what, Deutsche Bank? They're like, okay, you own the financial system. You, you, own the, you own the financial system. Why are you investing in blockchain? And they're like, well, if there's this new technology, we might as well own it. You know, that's our, we might as well get a piece of the pie. If this is where the growth is, we're gonna, even if the new technology is gonna destroy their monopoly, they say, well, if our monopoly is gonna be destroyed anyways, we might as well own the thing that's gonna, you know, the new thing. So their, their attitude, is, they don't care you know, they're playing the roulette and they don't care where it lands. They're going to own the whole, the, you know, you're playing Monopoly and you're going to land on this house or this house or this house. They don't care because they own all the houses. Power corrupts. And the absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Can you trust a corrupt system? I don't think so. So what are we doing today here in Malta, out of the goodness of the Maltese government's hearts? They are creating a crypto community which is accepted by, promoted by, and permitted by the government. I am thankful for that for one reason. It will allow our community to grow because it will have some degree of respectability. And uh, what we're going to have is 10 million blockchains, where each blockchain is a separate little LLC. It could be like a bakery in Mexico, and they incorporate in Delaware. They put their stock on uh, a blockchain, and suddenly the stock becomes a publicly tradable asset. We have millions or tens of millions of crypto assets where you can own 2% of a little bakery in Mexico, which, which uh, is generating money, it's a profitable business, it has an actual storefront, it, it's been around 30 years. So before, that asset would be too small to be on a public market, to be on the NASDAQ. But with the, then the overhead, the legal overhead, the regulatory overhead, the accounting overhead, the lawyers, the, all of that stuff, the registration fees, the SEC, the overhead would be so much that even if you could put uh, trade that asset, it wouldn't make sense. But with blockchain, we've, we've knocked out the overhead. We've destroyed the lawyers. We got rid of the lawyers. We got rid of the SEC. We got rid of the regulatory fee. We can we can get that asset on a blockchain for less than $10 a year soon. So it's going to start making sense to even put gift cards on blockchain, put coupons on blockchain, and then create markets for these assets. So when, when I, there's going to be a $10 trillion um, asset class for these, not necessarily what we call cryptocurrencies today, but crypto-backed assets, uh, assets on blockchain. So you're going to see these huge asset classes just materialize out of out of nowhere overnight as the technology matures over the next 10 years. According to Brandon Sinf's Inside, the powers that be will open up the pension funds into Bitcoin and create stocks that will be traded on the blockchain. While the trillion dollar market is sure to come, it will all be managed by the same gatekeepers that 10 years ago Satoshi Nakamoto wanted to counterway by introducing the Bitcoin white paper. Only time will tell. In the meantime, people could have escaped to the Malta Blockchain Summit official closing party by Futurama Blockchain Innovators, igniting everyone with girls dancing in laser costumes and even Mike Butcher of TechCrunch kicking it away as he shared his thoughts on the summit, along, of course, with other blockchainers that we couldn't have missed in this extremely packed after party. The great thing about having an event on an island like this is that everybody gets into the same space. You have an enormous community and uh, you're, you have the conversations are absolutely fantastic. Everybody's like in the same space and you're really like 
go for it on the same level. And I think it's so exciting. Malta, most progressive country in the world for crypto. The summit, Amon Poulos and those guys, how badass are they? Unbelievably exciting. How's the summit? I can't believe what Eamon has done three years ago to where he was, to where he is now. He's a market leader. He is breaking ground. Great people coming here to Malta, to our island. This is like, this is the most that we can show this year. But next year, stay with us. It's going to be more. I can't believe this many people showed up. It's ridiculous. There's like 10,000 or 15,000 people here. You can't even breathe. <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum EOS, EOS, Blockchain, BNB, Bitcoin, Ethereum, EOS, EOS. Bitcoin Cash. <laughs>You know, when I started, the idea was to have the show once a year. But the way things are changing in blockchain is so fast, so rapid. People can't afford to wait 12 months. So you bet there's going to be much more stuff coming out from our office. And if I can contribute to the blockchain community with the bit that I know how to do best, which is events, then I'm in it. Stay tuned for the Future Is Now documentary film series as we bring you the full, uncut interview with Brandon Sinf and all of its juicy details, as well as our next episode, Unconfiscatable, a Bitcoin maximalist conference. And join us May 23rd and 24th for another adventure at the Malta AI and Blockchain Summit. 2019, reigning in the fourth bill in Malta that will support businesses in AI, IoT, quantum technology, and blockchain. Let's build a new world together. I'm Miguel Francis Santiago, and the future is now. And I think I want to see the first applications where people are actually using blockchain at the community level, and I think that's the most important thing. Believe. And do what you love, always. If you're doing something, if you're getting up in the morning and you hate your job, well then stop doing your job. You should wake up every morning anxious, going, God, I can't wait to get to work. I can't wait to get to work. When we started out in the crypto world, that's what everybody did. Could not wait to take the next step. Get back to that.